This message is a presentation of Pinnacle Baptist Church and the preaching ministry of Pastor Ray McBerry. Other messages like this are available online at PinnacleBaptist.com. The church is located at 2517 High Falls Road in Griffin, Georgia. If you're in the area, we would love for you to visit us this Sunday. Now, here's today's message. Well, this morning we're back in Exodus chapter 24, and we're going to have a little bit of a treat this morning because in the remaining verses of Exodus chapter 24, where we left off last week, we're going to see one of the very few occasions in the Bible where we get to see a glimpse into the throne room of God. And so uh, it'll, it'll be something out of the ordinary. I think it'll be a blessing this morning. So here we are in Exodus chapter 24, and in the first eight verses that we looked at last week, we saw where God ratified the covenant with Israel there at the foot of Mount Sinai. Uh, Moses erected an altar at the instructions of the Lord. He also in, uh, erected uh, 12 pillars representing the 12 tribes of Israel right there near the altar at the foot of Mount Sinai. And then they offered a, uh, an animal sacrifice and Moses sprinkled half of the blood on the altar and the other half he sprinkled it on the people. And that is consecrating this covenant, showing that both uh, both parties, God and the people of Israel, are now bound by this covenant that they entered into. God offered them the covenant. They entered into it voluntarily of their own free will. And so both parties are bound to the terms of the covenant that God established with them. So here we are now in verse 9. And, and uh, beginning in verse number 9... We're going to see that Moses is about to make his way up the rest of the mountain, but we've got to get him up the mountain first. So verse number 9 says, Then went up Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel. And they saw the God of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone, and as it were the body of heaven in his clearness. And upon the nobles of the children of Israel he laid not his hand. Also they saw God and did eat and drink. And so what we have here in verses 9 through 11 is definitely one of the more unusual things mentioned in the Bible, but it's just kind of a passing thing. And if you're not careful, you would miss it in a casual reading of the text here. But the Bible says that Moses, his brother Aaron... And Aaron's two eldest sons, Nadab and Abihu, went with the 70 elders of Israel, and they went up the mountain. Now, they're not going to go all the way to the top of the mountain. They're going to go partway up the mountain. And God is not inviting all of them to go all the way to the top, where He is there at the top of the mountain, but He's inviting them to go up uh, part way up to the mountain before he descends to the top of the mountain to meet with Moses. So, so they all go up. There's 74 of them. They go part way up the mountain. And then we have a very curious thing. It says in verse 11, they saw God and did eat and drink. Now, this is, this is a very interesting thing that the Bible says because it says they saw God. And yet we know in other parts of the Bible, the Bible clearly teaches that no man hath seen God at any time. In fact, if you want to hold your place where we are here in Exodus, over in the Gospel of John chapter 1 in the New Testament, we of course have the, the famous passage where John begins chapter 1 verse 1, "...in the beginning was the Word." and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All of chapter 1 is talking about Jesus, the second person of the Godhead. But down in verse 18, it says uh, something that uh, seems to contradict with what we read in Exodus 24. Verse 18 says, No man had seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He hath declared Him. So verse 18 tells us that 
as far as man seeing God in his essence, who he is uh, as a spirit, no man has ever seen God. And of course, because God is a spirit, we and these human bodies of flesh that we currently have, we're unable to see God because He is a spirit. But what we see in Exodus 24 is that those that are there, the 74 men that go partway up Mount Sinai, are allowed to see a glimpse of God. They're allowed to see a part of Him, but not all of God in in all of His glory and all of His essence. So there are a couple of possibilities here as we read verses 9 through 11 like we just did. And one of the possibilities is that God could have appeared to the 74 in a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus, uh, just like we see in other places in the Old Testament. What are some of the other pre-incarnate appearances of Jesus we see in the Old Testament before He was born and laid in a manger in Bethlehem? That's right. Alex says when he, uh, when he ate with Abraham, the Bible says he literally sat there in the door of Abraham's tent and had a meal with him. But this is before Jesus was in the form of a man, yet he appeared, uh, he appeared like a man in the likeness of man and enough so that he was able to sit and have a meal and eat something with Abraham. There was a king that we think may have possibly been. That's right. Alex is talking about a king where Abraham offered tithes. That was Melchizedek, uh, the king of Salem, which is, of course, now the city of Jerusalem. So Abraham had several instances where he saw the second person of the Godhead. And uh, there are other instances in the Old Testament where he is referred to as the angel of the Lord. Not an angel, but the angel of the Lord. Jacob wrestled with the angel of the Lord. uh, And it is clear from the story that we're told, the context, it was Jesus. It was God uh, who appeared in the likeness of a man. And Jacob wrestled with him. Then there's the story of Gideon in the Old Testament. The angel of the Lord appeared to him as he's threshing wheat behind the wine press. Um, And then Gideon ends up offering a sacrifice to the angel of the Lord. We know this is is God. It's a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus. And I know we've talked about it many times. That is called a theophany, which is an appearance of God. Or in this particular instance, since it's the second person of the Godhead, it's actually a Christophany. That's right. And so anytime we see God appearing in a form that mankind can see with his physical eyes, it is not God the Father. It is always God the Son. And so this verses 9 through 11 that we just read could have been Uh, And some people believe it might have been Jesus appearing to the 74 and sitting down and having a meal with them. But I'm going to submit to you, I don't think that's what is going on in these verses. I think the other option is probably the more accurate. I think that what happened in verses 9 through 11 is that for just a moment, for just this, this short amount of time, God allowed... The, the heavens to open enough that these 74 could literally see into the throne room of God above them. You say, preacher, why do you say that? Well, look at the description of what they saw. It does not say they saw the face of God. It does not even say they saw the body of God. Look what it says in verse 10. And they saw the God of Israel, and there was under His feet, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone, and as it were, the body of heaven in His clearness. So what they saw was just uh, the feet and what's underneath His feet. They didn't see anything more than that. So hold your questions. I'll come back to those in just a few minutes. I want to submit to you that we have a, a picture here, I think, of of what they're seeing that is very similar to the other instances in the Bible where we catch a glimpse of the throne room of God. 
where God the Father is seated on His throne. We have, I'm going to attempt to draw something very crudely here. Here's the circle of the earth as described by Isaiah. We've talked about that many times in our study of biblical cosmology. And then above the circle of the earth is, what is that dome called? The firmament. And then above the firmament, we see the, uh, the throne of God up in the throne room there. I'm not very good at drawing a throne, uh, but we'll just let that be the throne of God. Now, I want us to hold our place here, but before we do, look at, look at what it says about, again, what they saw. They saw uh, there was under His feet, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone. Now, a sapphire stone is a bright blue stone. And so a bright blue stone uh, is what they saw right here under the feet of God as they're allowed to catch a glimpse of Him. So they're looking up and God has allowed them to see something that is only a few times uh, mentioned in Scripture where different individuals are given the opportunity to see into the throne room of God. But all that is described that they saw was what's right under His feet. So they didn't see the face of God. They didn't see all the glory of God. But they were allowed to catch a glimpse just of His feet and what is under it. By the way, I'm glad I had this blue marker up here for the whiteboard because that's what they saw. A bright blue sapphire stone uh, that as it were under His feet it was paved with a sapphire stone. All right, now we've looked at these other two passages I want to look at when we were in our study of biblical cosmology. And I want to submit to you that what we are about to see or what we're seeing here in verses 9 through 11 of Exodus 24 is uh, a surprise look at the firmament when this is just out of nowhere Right here in Exodus at the foot of Mount Sinai, we're given another description and a look at the firmament, which is only described this way in a couple of other places. So hold your place there in Exodus 24 and turn over to Ezekiel chapter number 1. Now, as we talked about in our series on biblical cosmology uh, several years ago, Ezekiel chapter 1 describes the firmament really even more so than Genesis chapter 1 does. It tells us a little more about it. First of all, in Ezekiel chapter 1, look at verse 4. Ezekiel says, I looked and behold a whirlwind coming out of the north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it. And out of the midst thereof, as the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire. So Ezekiel is, he is looking up from wherever he's standing down here on the earth. And as he looks up, he sees out of what he says, out of the north. Now, you and I know that based on uh, the way the Bible is described in its creation, that the north is that center of the circle of the earth. So just above that is where you and I know the north star is. We call it Polaris, the north star. But apparently above the north, that is a reference to where the throne of God is above the firmament of the earth because the Bible in the book of Psalms tells us that the earth is His footstool. Now that goes perfectly with what we just read in Exodus 24, verses 9 through 11, that under His feet were a pavement of a sapphire stone, a blue stone uh, above, uh, below His feet. So here's Ezekiel. Now in Ezekiel 1, he's looking up through the north, and he sees, as it were, above the north, an amber color. Now, you know what an amber color is. It's kind of a yellowish color, yellowish-orange. All right, now, we're still in Ezekiel 1. 
Skip down with me to verse 20, uh, 23. Uh, well, verse 22. And the likeness of the firmament upon the heads of the living creatures was as the color of the terrible crystal stretched forth over their heads above. Now the terrible crystal is the firmament. He uses the word firmament in the next verse. And under the firmament were their wings straight, the one toward the other. Everyone had two which covered on this side, and everyone had two which covered on that side their bodies. And when they went, I heard the noise of their wings like the noise of great waters as the voice of the Almighty, the voice of speech as the noise of an host. When they stood, they let down their wings. And there was a voice from the firmament that was over their heads when they stood and had let down their wings. And above the firmament, look at verse 26. This is exactly what we just saw in Exodus 24. Above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone. Now, What color is the sapphire stone? It's a blue, a a bright blue color. But it says, And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. Who is that sitting on the throne? Well, that's God. He's seeing the throne of God. God seated on the throne. But Ezekiel also doesn't see God in all His glory. He sees the likeness of God. God allows him to see just enough that he can see that God is there, seated on the throne, and not die. That's exactly right. All right, let's continue here. Verse number 27. And I saw as the color of amber, as the appearance of fire round about within it, and from the appearance of his loins even upward, and from the appearance of his loins even downward. I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire, and it had brightness round about. As the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. That was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face, and I heard a voice of one that spake. So Ezekiel is describing the same thing that these 74 elders of Israel saw in Exodus 24. He saw the throne of God and he sees the terrible crystal below the throne, which is as a sapphire stone. And the throne itself coming out of the throne, he sees the color of amber which he also then goes on to describe like as unto fire. Now it's interesting because the Bible elsewhere describes God as when it says our God is a consuming fire. Now we also see that Ezekiel said around the throne it was like a rainbow in the brightness. Now hold your, hold, keep holding your place in Exodus. We're through with Ezekiel for this morning. But turn over with me to the book of Revelation chapter 4. Last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter number 4. And this is another one of the very few times that we see the throne room of God. But this time, we're seeing it from a different vantage point than Ezekiel saw it. Ezekiel saw the throne room of God from the earth looking up through the terrible crystal, through the firmament, into the throne room of God. In Revelation chapter 4, God allow, that's right, God allows John to be up in the throne room of glory, looking, looking at it from above the firmament. So here we are in Revelation chapter number 4, look at verse 1. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, which is a good thing, by the way, because no man could see God with this body in this flesh. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, 
and one sat on the throne. All right, now that's the exact same thing Ezekiel saw, except John's up there with him. It's the exact same thing that the 74 elders of Israel saw in Exodus 24, except they, they were looking up, but they didn't get to see as much as Ezekiel saw. All they got to see was his feet and the pavement of a sapphire stone below his feet. Now look at verse 3 here in Revelation 4. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. Now, somebody that has their phone, look up and tell me what color is a jasper stone and what color is a sardine stone. I've already looked these up, so I know the answer, but uh, I, I want you to see it for yourself. Anybody? Uh, Google it. While you're doing that, I'm going to continue reading in verse 3. It says, And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. Well, we all know what an emerald stone color is. What's an emerald color? Green. Green. That's right. I mean, that's Lucky Charms and uh, uh, Ireland. All right, so... So again, we see the rainbow around the throne of God. John sees it more clearly than Ezekiel did looking up through the blue crystal. He sees that the rainbow is actually an emerald color. And by the way, I want to mention one other thing. The, the phenomenon that we know as the northern lights, the aurora borealis, it is only visible from here on earth with our human eyes if you are near the, the Arctic Circle, the North Pole, which as we just said, is uh, the North Pole is the center of the circle of the earth. Isn't it interesting, the only place you can see in the sky here on earth that, that eerie greenish glow at times, is directly above the North Pole. I can't help but wonder, I don't know this for a fact, but I cannot help but wonder if that is not at certain times that we are able to see the, the reflection or the, the image, the likeness of that emerald rainbow around the throne of God. Because the Bible clearly tells us that His throne is in the north. And so I, I would say the, the aurora borealis phenomenon may very well be. We're seeing the literal reflection of or likeness of that emerald rainbow around the throne of God. And I'm going to tell you, for, for somebody that actually believes in biblical <laughs> cosmology, it's just one more thing that makes sense about what we see in, in, in the natural world with our own eyes even, that supports the biblical model of cosmology where science says we don't know what it is. We can't explain it. And they come up with hypotheses. But, but if you read your Bible, the Bible tells us there's an emerald rainbow around the throne of God in the north. So maybe that is what it is. Maybe it's not. I'm just saying there's a good possibility, I think. All right, so somebody, did anybody look up what is the color of a jasper stone? I did. Um, it came up. But Multiple. Blue was in there. I don't know if that's the. Okay. But I found so clear. Okay. Uh, so we're seeing different colors here. I looked it up in several places because the, I, I saw the same thing you did. There, there's a variation, but most of the jasper stones are a yellowish color, almost the same as amber. The sardine stone, anybody look that one up? Red blood. A blood red, yes. So uh, like a blood red. So I find it interesting that it's, it's describing the emerald rainbow around the throne, the throne being sapphire like the crystal underneath it, but, coming, but, but what is in the throne, which is where God sits Himself, is a yellowish blood red color that is the same as the amber color that we saw in his, that, that Ezekiel saw. And so God, where God is seated on the throne, is a, it looks just like a flame. The colors of uh, orange and bright red, just like a flame has. And then there's the emerald rainbow around the throne, 
the throne itself is a blue sapphire, and underneath it is the crystal, what Ezekiel calls the terrible crystal. In Exodus 24, we see that it is a bright blue. It is a sapphire stone color as well. I'll mention one other thing just for what it's worth. have no idea if it's connected to the firmament or not, but there have been large chunks of blue stones found in various places around the earth, even in, in the last hundred years, that scientists say we don't really know what it is or where it came from because there's nothing like it anywhere around. It doesn't match up with any of the rocks or mountains or earth around it. Just chunks that they have found lying on the surface of the earth. Especially there have been several found in the Sahara Desert, and uh, I think some in South America. Arizona. But these, these large blue stones, when they test it to discover the chemical composition of it, it comes back where it's over 90% oxygen, but it's a bright blue in color. Some people that do believe in biblical cosmology have surmised that maybe those are actually pieces of the firmament that have fallen to the earth. I don't, again, I don't know if that's the case, but we do know that that is the color of the firmament. I think that's also maybe a, a good explanation for why the sky is blue, because the firmament itself is described in every place we see it by color as blue, like a sapphire stone. That's why the sky is blue, because the firmament is blue. All right, now. I will get questions at the end, but let me go back to Exodus 24, uh, lest I get too far afield here. I, I don't know about you, but just I was not expecting until I was preparing for our study here in Exodus over the last few weeks, I was not prepared uh, to see anything to do with biblical cosmology in something that happened at Mount Sinai. And I have read this passage, I don't know how many times in my life, but I've never noticed what it said about they saw His feet and under it were as the pavement of a sapphire stone. Never occurred to me before. I just kept right on reading and never thought about any significance to it. But it matches up perfectly with what we see in Ezekiel and what we see in Revelation as well plus what Psalm says about the earth being the footstool of God. All right, so now I'll go back to verse 11. So the, the 70 that were there with uh, Moses, Aaron, ah, uh, Abihu, and Nadab, they ate and drank. You might say, why did, why did God have them eat and drink there in His presence? Well, I think part of it is because in the Old Testament, one of the things that was a part of confirming a covenant was having a meal together, sitting down and having a meal. In fact, if you remember the Abrahamic covenant, when God uh, um, confirmed His covenant with Abraham, one of the things He did is He had Abraham sit down and eat uh, while they were there. Um, usually uh, a covenant being confirmed or a treaty being ratified, the two parties would sit down and have a meal together. Is still somewhat the custom among men today. But also I think it was God wanting these 74 elders of Israel to have the opportunity to commune with Him in a very real way, in a way that nobody else was given the opportunity to do, while they could see enough into heaven to at least see the feet of God and what was below His feet, to know that they were in the presence of God. Now that's important because they need to understand the seriousness of the covenant they just made and with whom they made the covenant. That He is in fact God. I do not think that these 74 men could have walked away that day and not known they had been in the presence of the Creator. That, I think, is the significance of God allowing them to do something that nobody else had the opportunity to partake in. 
So if nobody else knew for sure that God met with Israel at Mount Sinai, those 74 men should have had no doubts, no questions, just by what they witnessed themselves. All right, now, verse 12. And the Lord said unto Moses, Come up to me in the mount and be there, and I will give thee tables of stone and a law and commandments which I have written that thou mayest teach them. So here's where God's telling Moses, all right, you leave those other 70 down there. I want you to come on up here with me into the mountain, and I'm going to give you what you and I know as the Ten Commandments written in tables of stone. Verse 13, And Moses rose up, and his minister Joshua, and Moses went up into the mount of God. So he leaves them down... I don't know if you've ever, any of you that have ever been to Stone Mountain, that place where you walk, if you've ever walked up the trail going up to Stone Mountain, when you go just a very short ways up, not even a quarter of a mile maybe, there's a big flat area where there, uh, there are flagpoles erected there. And I kind of think of that as kind of the area where the 74 elders of Israel sat and had a meal. But then God tells Moses to come on up. So he and Joshua start up the mountain. Joshua, the Bible calls him Moses' minister. That's, that is, he was there to be a help to Moses, to be a servant to Moses. He was there to, to assist Moses. I mean, just think about it. Moses is 80 years old at this point, uh, and he's walking up Stone Mountain or something similar. Up Stone Mountain to go pick up. Some heavy stones. Yeah, that's right. Going to pick up some stone tablets at the top. So Moses and Joshua go on up. They leave those other 70 uh, down there, 72 where they are. And he said unto the elders, Tarry ye here for us until we come again unto you. And behold, Aaron and her are with you. If any man have any matters to do, let him come unto them. So Moses said, Don't you all try to follow me up the mountain. You stay down here. But while you're down here, if you have any problems, any uh, judicial matters, then Aaron and Hur will hear them. Now Moses said this because, as you know, Moses had kind of been the, the judge of Israel as well as the, the king leading them out. That's why Moses is sometimes considered uh, a type or a picture of Jesus because he was at the same time, prophet, priest, and king to Israel. Well, he's also the judge, and so he tells them, though, Aaron and Hur will take care of any matters while I'm gone. And Moses went up into the mountain, and a cloud covered the mountain. So a, a cloud comes and covers the top of the mountain. And the glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And the seventh day he called Moses out of the midst of the cloud. So Moses and Joshua go on up the mountain. I don't know how close to the top they went. Maybe they just went halfway. Here's the mountain. Uh, they, they had the meal down here near the base of the mountain. Uh, Moses and Joshua go up, I suppose, maybe halfway, maybe a little farther than halfway. We don't know. But then they stay here for six days. Moses and Joshua are here for six days. And there's a cloud that whole six days around the top of the mountain where God has come down to. On the seventh day, God tells Moses, okay, you come on up. Not Joshua, just Moses. So look, here we are, verse 17. And the sight of the glory of the Lord was like devouring fire on the top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. All right, now where are the children of Israel? Yeah, they're still down here at the bottom. And so they're all down here. They look up. They see, of course, that cloud, but they see what looks like a consuming fire on top of the mountain. You already know what fire looks like. Uh, a, a flame of fire, as we just said a few minutes ago, is a, a yellowish, orangish, reddish color. That's what a flame looks like. That's what they perceive from down here where they were. Moses is going up into the cloud on the top of the mountain where that is. 
Now, I'll say one other thing about the fire on the top of the mountain as Moses is about to go up. One of the things about that mountain that we saw in the film about two months ago now, where we believe the actual location of Mount Sinai is over here in the land of Midian, which is in Saudi Arabia, not over here in the Sinai Peninsula. The mountain that they believe that it is, the top of that mountain is totally different than any other mountain in that whole area. That's right. It's scorched. It's actually black. And you can even see it from the ground. It is totally black. Those who have gone up there, the top of it, when you get up there, the reason it's black, it's because it's like black glass. Obsidian, is that the right uh, mineral that I'm thinking of? Uh, It's like black glass. It's like the top of the mountain at one time was literally melted and then it hardened and turned to something similar to obsidian, which looks like black glass, where it literally, the presence of God, it appears, literally melted the top of the mountain when God came down during that first six days. So, verse 18, And Moses went into the midst of the cloud and get him up into the mount. And Moses was in the mount forty days and forty nights. So, uh, we have that uh, Moses was down here for about six days with waiting with Joshua, and then uh, God says, Moses, you come on up to the very top. And he goes up into the cloud, and he's there for forty days. Now the number 40, of course, is seen in Scripture and other places. The number of 40 seems to be a number that usually is related to uh, God testing someone, as in uh, it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. Jesus was in the wilderness being uh, fasting and praying before His temptation for 40 days and nights. So there... Normally, uh, preachers like to associate the number 40 with a a period of testing. I don't know that Moses was being tested, but certainly his willingness to come up into the mountain was a test of sorts, I suppose, in itself. He knows there's a holy, righteous God there, and he's about to go up and and meet with God in the cloud. What do you think the cloud's for? Do you think the cloud is to obscure himself or to protect them? I, I think maybe a little of both. Brother Kevin asked what's the what we think is the purpose of the cloud. I think you're right. It was partially to obscure his appearance because they couldn't have beheld it. Yeah. But also remember that, that uh, the way he had been leading them ever since they left Egypt was in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. So it is... It is the glory of the Lord that is appearing there on top of the mountain. The word, the, the word I'm about to say is not found in Scripture, but it's used to describe the glory of the Lord, the Shekinah glory of God. That is the presence of God. God temporarily dwelt there on top of that mountain. He resided there on top of that mountain. His, it was the place of His presence for 40 days, maybe 46. But later on, when we see in the tabernacle and in the temple, the Ark of the Covenant, where the cherubim are on either ends of it, looking down at the mercy seat, the lid of the Ark, the Bible tells us that God resided, the presence of God resided on the mercy seat, between the cherub. And so, this is the presence of God. And I think Kevin's right. I, I think the cloud is also partially to cloak some of His glory because they could not have withstood it if they had seen Him in all His glory. We know that from what we read elsewhere in the Bible. Alright, any other questions now before I finish? Alright. Well, we've got Moses up there. He's up there for 40 days. You know there's some other stuff that's going to be going on down here at the foot of the mountain. In the meanwhile, 
but it's going to take us a little while to get there because what we're going to see in the next couple of chapters is God giving Moses the pattern for the tabernacle. How he wants the tabernacle designed, what he what materials he wants them to use to build it, and what the significance is of each piece of it. It is a beautiful picture of Christ. Every part of the tabernacle in some way portrays some aspect or attribute of Christ and His sacrifice that would come much later. So it's an exciting study. We're going to dive into uh, seeing the different parts of the tabernacle beginning next Sunday. Dear Heavenly Father, thank You for an opportunity to study Your Word and Lord, to even have a surprise appearance of the firmament and the throne room of God right here at the foot of Mount Sinai. Lord, I pray that You'd help us to appreciate what You've chosen to reveal to us in Your Word. Lord, may it strengthen our faith in You and in the Word of God. And Lord, may we have the reverence we should have for a holy, righteous God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.